Hello, and welcome to Books and Books. If you would please turn your cell phones off, and um, please know that this is being live streamed, and if you would like the book autographed, you can get it uh, shipped free if you just call this number um, during the event. And um, I want to know, I want you to know that it is a great honor for me to introduce to you Lily Capel, author of nonfiction works like The Red Leather Diary, which I read and found fascinating in 2009. And now I want to extol the Astronaut Wives Club, which I read with tremendous enthusiasm a year ago. Now, you may not think I am donned in my usual attire. I am wearing a simple sheath, um, <laughs> it, pearl earrings, and, you know, um, oh, this, this awful charm bracelet that keeps me getting stuck to my dress. Um, but I wanted to look like an astronaut wife. And um, we, <laughs> we are looking back 50 years ago into the pre-feminist world of the astronauts' wives. They were stay-at-home wives in Houston who formed a sisterhood. They lived it and shared fear for their hero husbands' lives, but were expected to be perfect to the public. Under great scrutiny, they did what they could with their public personae, while struggling with their mutual and private challenges and emotional stamina. Lily Capel is young, and that is great because we will be hearing much more from her down the road. In her book, The Astronaut Wives Club, she pays tribute to these women and shares with us the emotional side of the space race. Thank you, Lily. me of maybe what an astronaut wife club gathering would be like during the day you know but all of your men would be riding rockets or you'd be the lonely astronaut here which you would never allow of course um, but yeah wonderful to be here um, I'm from New York I've been going around on the paperback book tour and uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself um, I, I'm also trying to look like an astronaut wife but uh, uh, you know, or maybe an astro kid, I don't know. <laughs> um, I grew up in Chicago, I moved to New York to go to college at Barnard, and I uh, started my career at the New York Times, writing about celebrities and writing hu human interest profiles. Um, but I think both of my books, The Red Leather Diary and The Astronaut Wives Club, go back to um, my English major, of course, and one professor that I had. And she was a wonderful teacher. Her name was Professor Vandenberg. And uh, she had a picture of Gertrude Stein hanging over her desk. And uh, it was sort of punk rock and just said wonderful things. But one of the things she always told us was that often women weren't included in official histories, that their stories are told in diaries and scraps of letters in the margins. And this was something that really resonated with me, though I didn't understand how much, I think, until later. Um, my first book ended up being about a found diary found in an old steamer trunk um, in a dumpster full of about 30 old steamer trunks outside of my Upper West Side building, so a bit of dumpster diving, but a real historical sort of treasure, um, treasure trove. And then the Astronaut Wives Club story came to me in a similar flash of lightning way. When I was publicizing the Red Leather Diary, I would go around the country and people would raise their hands at the end of that talk and they would say, well, have you found anything else interesting in dumpsters recently? I said, no, I don't go around climbing into the garbage, you know? This was a very special dumpster full of like Louis Vuitton trunks. <laughs> but um, I was sitting at home one Saturday with my husband. We live in Manhattan. We have a loft, and he's also a writer. And we had bought a large coffee table book, and it was a re-release of Norman Mailer's book. Not only did Tom Wolfe write about write an opus about the space program, but so did um, Norman Mailer. It's called Moonfire. So I thought I was having sort of this tomboyish moment, and I'm looking at pictures of Neil Armstrong planting the flag and the lunar surface. 
of Buzz Aldrin in this spacey white NASA suit. And all of a sudden, I turn a page and I see this group of women. And they're wearing poochy mini dresses. And they have these skyrocketing beehives that, you know, literally look like they put their jello mold on top of their hair. <laughs> and they're all standing around the model of the moon that's sort of plaster, almost as if they're selling a Maytag. And I just turned to my husband and I said, he loves the right stuff in Apollo 13, as do I. And I said, has anything ever been written about these women? And he said, I don't think so. And it just sort of took off running from there. I found out that most of the women are still alive, that they're in their 70s and 80s, but have been part of this space sorority. And some of them actually call themselves space sisters for decades since the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo program, that they meet for reunions, go on cruises, that they raise their families in the space burbs, as they were known, outside of Houston. And this was this incredible sort of Jetsons world back in the day when Houston was known as Space City, USA, and all of the astronauts built their dream homes there because they had gotten this contract from Life magazine for half a million dollars. So they were able to afford some goodies. And this was almost like the Beverly Hills, really, of astronauts. There would be tour buses. They would wind their way through the subdivision streets and look for Neil Armstrong's house and John Glenn's house. And, you know, usually, like, Neil, of course, wouldn't be in his silver space suit look, mowing the lawn during the weekend. So a driver would pull up and say, hey, you know, you know where any astronauts live around here, buddy? And Neil would be like, yeah, that way. Because they had very limited time with their families. The men are training all week at Cape Canaveral, um, being followed by the dreaded Cape Cookies, which were the groupies that followed the astronauts like they were the Beatles. Um, you know, these guys were like rock stars back in the day, and they were as, you know, as desired after as the Beatles. And so they would get these dollar a night rooms at the Holiday Inn where all the astronauts hung out and drive dollar a year Corvettes. So it was a huge learning curve for the wives. But I want to take you back to when the space race kicks off. And this is April 9th, 1959. And um, it's the height of the Cold War. You have the whole country, the whole world, looking to the announcement of the Mercury 7 astronauts. And this is John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Alan Shepard. So they're all at a, at a press conference in Washington. And they're about to be announced. And um, these guys have gone through really rigorous testing to be selected, which if you've seen the right stuff, you've seen it touched upon. But they were going to be human cannonballs, essentially. So they had to be like 100% grade A American beefcake. And, you know, they're heroic. They come from a test pilot background. So they expect all the questions are going to be, you know, about their military record, about their bravery and volunteering for this audacious act, which is first in space. And instead, the first question comes and it's, what does your wife think about this? <laughs> you know, she's going to let you be catapulted out of this world. So all of a sudden, there's this focus on the women's stories. Um, back in the day, of course, the women couldn't be completely candid. But I thought that telling the story from the wives' perspective was a real way to get to the sort of emotional heart of this story. Because many of the astronauts, they were engineers, they were military test pilots, very directed, but had a hard time talking about their feelings. So when reporters really wanted to know from Neil Armstrong, what did it feel like to land on the moon? Or did you have any dreams on the way there? And they started spouting numbers and vectors. Again, it was like, OK, I'm going to go talk to your wife. So um, we meet some of these women. Uh, Reen Carpenter was this vivacious blonde who JFK said was her favorite astronaut wife. She wakes up in Garden Grove, which is a little subdivision by Disneyland, that morning of the press conference in Washington. And all of a sudden, there's some headlights in her front yard. And who could this be? Well, 
it's reporters coming to interview her. And she was, you know, not a shrinking violet. She'd wanted to be an actress and a writer growing up. So she's just thrilled to have reporters coming into her home. And she opens the door and offers them coffee and invites them in. And um, what I sort of found out was the wives were really almost America's first reality stars. You have private women who've been living um, a difficult life with a, a test pilot husband, not knowing if he's going to come home at night for dinner. Um, they would always want to call at five o'clock if the man wasn't coming home. Uh, you know, you hear stories like the women would look at the um, the sky around an airbase to see if there were any dark clouds, which might a plane had gone down. And anyway, all of a sudden, their husbands are made astronauts, and this is just a Cinderella-like transformation. Is Reen Carpenter, um, sort of, who's like the Marilyn Monroe of this space age among the women? She's right front and center on the cover of the paperback. She would say it was as if I was living my life on a dark stage, and suddenly somebody turns on the spotlight, and it doesn't go away for another ten years. But I just want to read a really brief selection, and then I want to lead you through some of the photos that really helped to bring this story alive for me. To be an astronaut wife meant tea with Jackie Kennedy, high society galas, and instant celebrity. It meant smiling perfectly after a makeover by Life magazine, balancing an extravagantly lacquered rocket-style hairdo, and teetering in high heels at the crux of the space age. The astronaut wives were ordinary housewives, most all of them military wives living in drab housing on Navy and Air Force bases. When their husbands, the best test pilots in the country, were chosen to man America's audacious adventure to beat the Russians in the space race, they suddenly found themselves very much in the public eye. As her husband trained for every possible aspect of space flight, each woman had to prepare for the day when she would have to face the television cameras, when the world would be scrutinizing her hair, her complexion, her outfit, her figure, her poise, her parenting skills, her diction, her charm, and most of all, her patriotism. She had to appear calm and composed while her husband was strapped atop what was essentially the world's largest stick of dynamite, <laughs> seconds away from being blasted off into space. And the Mercury 7 wives who kick off the program um, and really form this space sistership, sisterhood, they would go down for these early um, pre-flight, these early test launches in, uh, on, in Cocoa Beach and Cape Canaveral. And uh, the rocket would blow up in front of their faces. And they would turn to each other and they would say, thank God the monkey wasn't in that one. And they started coaching each other when they were being photographed for Life magazine and being approached by reporters and had no idea what these technological details meant. They'd say, well, don't worry, just tell them it's classified. <laughs> so they just come up with this great way to sort of buoy each other along. Um, that sort of matches your dress, the, the <laughs> mint. Um, there are these wonderful pastel colors, like macaroons or sherbets. But here, here they are, um, the Mercury 7 astronauts. Reen Carpenter, as I mentioned, was sort of vivacious and outgoing. Um, she would later write this uh, newspaper column that was syndicated in 40 papers across the country and by the end of this space program and is hosting her own feminist talk show looks like Gloria Steinem only wears mini skirts as she tells the New York Times but you know although it starts out in a pre-feminist era we sort of see glimpses of the launch of the modern woman throughout their story as well um, and this is what I mean by America's first reality stars. <laughs> oh, right, exactly. <laughs> well, Life magazine wanted them all to be like Barbie, and we'll get to that. Um, but, you know, you have this group of women who are getting to know each other, but they are being shot all the time by a photographer. They have to protect their children because the press attention is so intense that reporters will chase their kids down the hallways of the Holiday Inn. 
Um, so here they are just trying to smile pretty and not look terrified about what their husbands are about to go through. Um, and they also had sort of secrets that they couldn't reveal about themselves. One of NASA's first prerequisites wasn't only the test pilot career of the husbands, they decided not to use stunt devils, but test pilots, but um, that each man had a wife and a perfect family. Um, Trudy Cooper and her husband Gordo, he was separated from Trudy when he was going through the astronaut selection process and he realized there was no way he was going to be made an astronaut if he wasn't married. So he drives across a few state lines, goes back to Trudy, says, you know, I have this really great opportunity to go into space. What do you think, Trudy? And she was a pilot herself and very adventurous and she gets back together with him for the sake of the space race. Marge Sladen was divorced, but this was taboo. So, you know, she couldn't reveal that to NASA or obviously to Life magazine. This is um, Reem Carpenter during her husband Scott's um, mission. He was the second American to orbit the Earth after John Glenn. And one of the things I was surprised to find out was sort of the very little support the women got from NASA. I mean, they're sort of dished up to the American public, but they're given very little training, no training, in, in order to how to, you know, perform as public personalities. And they were sort of just expected to be the nice housewife and stay at home and don't say anything that would affect negati negatively affect their husband's careers. But Reen was really a rebel, and she was outspoken. And she said that, you know, although NASA had this policy of no wives going down to the Cape or Cocoa Beach for their husband's launches, she said, you know, this is incredibly historical, not only for the whole world and the country, but especially for my family. And we're going down there. They went down there, and she actually had to go undercover because the press scrutiny was so intense. But here she is at a really difficult moment. Uh, Walter Cronkite's just announced that they can't find Scott. She doesn't know if he burned up um, going back, it, coming back into the atmosphere or what, and for an hour they're trying to find him. And then finally, comically, um, he is spotted and he's in his life raft with his hands behind his head, eating some leftover space food. But they were sort of the beatnik couple um, and really fascinating to write about. This is a typical scene from the space burbs, as they were known, outside of Houston. And journalists called the neighborhood Togethersville, which sounds like something out of the Stepford Wives, almost. And the wives joked about that because it was, in a way, reflective of their experiences, always having to put on this um, perfect facade. They even had a motto that they came up with, which was, happy, proud, and thrilled. And when the reporters <laughs> asked them, how they were feeling when their husband was up there on the launch pad. And, you know, it was just like, you can't put this into words. They were just going to, you know, break down into tears. It was always happy, proud, and thrilled. And it was almost their keep calm and carry on 1960s style. But this is sort of very typical of the wives' gatherings. They had these wonderful splashdown parties and mission watch parties and moonwalking parties. They also had superstitions with the very dangerous nature of their husband's work. And one of them that they all shared was you never pop the champagne until a successful splashdown. So this is Apollo 11, and the boys are home, and so everybody's celebrating. Um, to give you a sense of the way the wives had to protect their families, Pat Collins, her husband Mike, for lack of a better technological term, sort of drove Neil and Buzz to the moon, and Neil and Buzz go down, and they do their moonwalk, and everyone lamented the fact that, oh, but Mike is the poet. Mike should have gone down to the surface of the moon. He has such a way with words. All the wives are saying to each other at home, Neil and Buzz, you know, our neighbors, they, they're so taciturn. This is going to be the most boring few hours of television ever. What are they going to talk about? But of course, they were, you know, really moved, as everyone was, by um, Neil and what he said when he landed. But uh, 
during the mission, they have to tell their kids not to answer the door, not to talk to reporters. Well, Pat's daughter did answer the door and was met by two reporters sort of in disguise, handing her a little teddy bear as a present. She brings it in, and later her mother found a microphone in its stomach. So these were the sort of cat and mouse games the wives are constantly having to protect their families from. This is one of my favorite pictures. You can see that selling a Maytag like uh, <laughs> um, pose here. And this is the Mercury Seven Wives, who are the first group of wives all coming together for their first Life magazine photo shoot. And a really diverse group of women. And uh, they're all nervous. They all don't know quite what they've gotten themselves into. And they're told by NASA all to wear these perfect pastel shirtwaist dresses. <laughs> and so everyone's game to comply. I mean, they're military wives. They're used to following orders. And they're used to ironing a lot of uniforms. <laughs> but Reen, of course, says, well, you know, our husbands are no longer military. Uh, NASA is a civilian agency. I'm not going to wear a uniform. And she shows up in this sort of sexy cocktail number and, you know, causes a lot of eyebrows to raise. but. Uh, I think really makes the shot is matching the capsule. They nicknamed it the can because it did look so flimsy in person and uh, you know just cannot believe that their husbands are about to go where no one's ever gone in that. This is the wives first cover for Life magazine and you can see up there it says astronaut wives their inner thoughts worries and Almost America has this fascination with the spacemen's wives as if there's something out of science fiction. You know, one of the wives describes being looked at by someone at the local pool as if she had antenna growing over her head, you know, just because her husband's job. Um, this has a cute story, too. All the women, you know, they're thinking about what they should wear. Um, they decide to wear pink lipstick because they think, well, we're mothers, we're housewives, we w don't want to seem too forward. Pink, you know, think pink. Pink is for the perfect housewife. And then they get the magazine, and all of a sudden, they're in this bright red. And what happened? And they were really shocked. We would never wear lipstick that bright. And so they call the editors in life, and they learn if it's been retouched in the lab. And, you know, it's just like, ladies, this is the space age, and patriotic red is what the perfect astronaut wife has to wear. So, you know, their images are getting um, ahead of them, so to speak. This is Annie Glenn, who is married to John Glenn and is to this day. Um, all of the couples were sort of in a, they were in a competition with each other. Of course, the men are incredibly competitive. They compete on water skis, handball. Of course, the big prize is who's going to be in, f in space first, who's going to orbit the Earth first. And the wives, in order to survive this sort of new cutthroat world, turned to each other and said, you know, we really have to be above the competition, which they tried to be, and they supported each other. But of course, it was ultimately, you know, you wanted your husband to be first, too. But this is just, I love this picture because it's sort of the tough woman in the background, even in the days where the wife was supposed to, you know, was expected to be the arm candy for her astronaut. Annie and John had a really special relationship. And I think this is why sort of the whole country fell in love with them. And they were the quintessential astronaut and astronaut wife couple. They had met in New Concord, Ohio in a playpen. They both had these, you know, just homespun freckles they were sprinkled with. You know, Annie just looked ready to bake an apple pie when John came home from space. And uh, he called her the rock and she really did support him. And uh, all the other astronaut couples felt that they couldn't possibly live up to the shining example of the Glenses. But Annie also had a very difficult time because she had a terrible stutter that she'd had since childhood. So being in the public eye was excruciating for her. So she had to rely on her kids and on the other astronaut wives to sort of act as her voice. And Reen Carpenter, um, the Marilyn Monroe of the group, uh, she ended up um, sort of coaching Annie along. And she would do this one-woman show where she would pretend she was a 
you know, Katie Couric of her era interviewing the perfect astronaut wife, which she called, who she called primly stable, because this is, of course, what NASA demanded of the women. And primly stable was married to her perfect astronaut, squarely stable, and they had their dog <laughs> smiley. And, uh, you know, it would, it would be like, okay, primly, well, once you have him back on Earth, what would your other one wish be? And Primly would just sort of stand there dumbly and say, I'd love an Electrolux vacuum cleaner <laughs> with all of the attachments. So uh, you see the Stepford wives there. This is the women um, in the early days of the program in Cocoa Beach. Uh, watching Alan Shepard take off in May 1961, becoming the first American into space. And in the early days, the women weren't allowed on the Cape, the military installation where the rockets take off from. They had to go watch their, their launches from the public beach with the rest of the hoi polloi. So here they are, and they're wearing their fabulous, you know, cat eye sunglasses and just watching it take off. Um, Marge Sladen in the front she thought that this was really sort of bizarre. Why weren't the wives allowed on the Cape? And she didn't like it at all. It's like, what's going on with the secretaries out there? Or what? I mean, why can't we go out? So she convinces her husband, Deke, to drive her out there. She's laying in the back seat of his car under some blankets and finally makes it out there to the launch pad. And if you've been to the launch pad, I mean, there's not a whole lot to see, but like some lonely scrub grass and, um, you know, the surface. And she sees the flight director out there and she's really worried. She's messed up Deke's chances to get into space. This is Betty Grissom, um, who was a really fascinating character to write about. Um, she's in that early Mercury 7 group. She and her husband, Gus, were from Indiana. They were sort of known as the Hoosier astronaut and wife, um, more of the country, country mouse, and weren't mediagenic at all. Gus would tell the reporters famously, we don't give a damn about keeping up with the Joneses, which was more like we don't give a damn about keeping up with the Glenses. Um, they had been together as high school sweethearts. On that first day when the guys are announced, Betty was home, she had the flu, she said the house was a mess, her hair was a mess, she uh, goes to the grocery store to pick up a few things and all of a sudden is being followed around by two reporters who follow her home and all of a sudden they're like, you know, they, they sort of, you know, multiply very quickly. They're, her house is suddenly filled with 20 reporters and uh, they're setting up television cameras in her kitchen, etc. And so Betty was never one who really wanted to talk to the media. And she goes, she has sort of a hard time during this, the space program. Her husband, Gus, sinks his mercury capsule upon splashdown. He screws the pooch. The hatch blows too early, and the capsule's lost. And, you know, very expensive capsule that was recording all sorts of data. Later, they found out it probably wasn't his fault. But, ja but Betty gets, she doesn't get to meet Jackie Kennedy, which was sort of the, the cherry on top for all of the wives. So this is at that moment when she was expecting to be feted just like Louise Shepard had been for the last launch with Alan, and uh, things did not turn out as planned. And this, this resonates throughout her, her narrative because Gus is one of the three astronauts who's killed in NASA's first large tragedy, which is the Apollo 1 fire, when a flash fire kills three astronauts on the launch pad in 1967. So she just really has a lot to deal with. And NASA was still figuring out how to, how to really deal with everything. I mean, they were so focused on getting the men to the moon that the families were often left behind as sort of the casualties. And the first death that happens in NASA, um, an official doesn't get to notify the woman um, in the proper time. And so a reporter actually shows up at this woman, Faith Freeman's door, and asks for her reaction to her husband's death. And she has no idea what's happened. So after that, they start this protocol where the women's friends will all go over to a widow's house, but it has to be a man or an official from NASA that gives the final news. So 
Betty's at her friend's house playing a game of poker, and all of a sudden, Annie Glenn's at her house, Joe Shura's at her house, Serene Carpenter. And so very quickly, before the real official news came, you knew, she knew. And um, she said to me, though, it was like I had been preparing since, you know, when we got married for this day because Gus was a test pilot. It was this daily fear that they all lived with, but they had this code of never talking about those fears. It would be subtle little things like Annie and John Glenn had a way of reassuring each other. When John went on any of his missions, he would say, I'm going to the corner store to pick up a pack of gum. And Annie would always say, don't be long. Mm -hmm. Gus once told Betty, he said, you know, if I die, I want you to have a party. And I think this is one of the only conversations they ever had about that possibility. And she just said, okay, we'll have a party. And so she sort of tried to keep that optimism. She, um, she would actually sue NASA's largest contractor over the building of that Apollo 1 space capsule for $10 million. And so she became sort of the most hated woman in Togethersville because all the wives were very intimidated of NASA. It was sort of like big brother out there. But uh, she stood up for what she felt she had to do. And the other wives, um, the other widows of the Apollo 1 fire also received similar settlements. So looking back on it this day, all the wives felt that she really, she was sort of a quiet hero. You know, she really did what she had to do. And cutely, because this writing the book involved me going all around the country and interviewing over 30 women and all of them felt Betty was pretty private so they would sort of whisper well is Betty gonna talk to you I doubt Betty's gonna talk to you but she ended up being just really lovely in person she's in her late 80s and when I went to her house in Houston you know just to get things off lightly I said well do you have any of your things from back in the day clothes all the women loved Neiman Marcus because it was the Dallas based department store and Betty sort of lights up and she says do you want to see my fur hot pants <laughs> I was like yes definitely she ended up having like this whole archive of her outfits from Neiman's back in the day but you could, I had always heard that Togethersville was a very swinging place on the weekend when the guys came home and they would um, fly their T-38s into the space burbs and they would buzz the top of their homes by going down low, you know, and it was like, hi, honey, I'm home, you know, put the meatloaf in, let's get going. Um, this is just a picture of the wives um, in the early days, actually before it mo the program moves to Houston, this is in... Um, Virginia and uh, you know Joe Shura one of the wives said to me you know our lives are really composed of highs and lows and they were sort of the highest highs and often the lowest lows but I think it kept them very grounded and sort of down-to-earth women they're going to the Kennedy White House they're going around the world and presenting moon rocks to heads of state but they're always coming home and chauffeuring the kids and making plates of deviled eggs for the splashdown parties and just makes them very relatable. This is Marilyn Lovell, who many of you will know from the movie Apollo 13. And Marilyn became a really good friend while I was writing the book. Um, she and her husband lived between Lake Forest and, and Texas. But here she is during Apollo 13, Jim, her husband, is in a crippled spacecraft. She's not sure if he's going to make it home from the moon. She's just trying to keep her whole family optimistic and, um, you know, not lose faith, not lose hope. And right here, she's sort of breaking down, and she's she has this space, it's a very space age device. It was called a squawk box, and all of the women had these installed in their homes in the space burbs, and they would they would transmit the um, conversations between mission control and the astronauts. So oftentimes the women would go to sleep just listening to the gurgle of voices on the squawk box and they really felt that they were sort of along for the mission themselves. This is Joan Aldrin who is married to Buzz Aldrin um, who walked with Neil Armstrong on the moon and Joan herself was an actress. The, many, some of the wives had this theater troupe in the space burbs, which she performed in.
But if you ever wondered, I know everyone has their own story of where they were when we landed on the moon, unless, like me, you weren't around for that part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but this is when Eagle landed, what the wives were doing back at home. And I was recently in LA and speaking with Joan in an event, and I asked her about this photograph. She just said, you know, it was surreal for everybody, but imagine if it was your husband. And it was just overwhelming to her. And uh, she's just, I think, just expressing how happy she is that they actually landed. Because until they did land, they had no idea if it was going to be successful or not. Um, but of course, here, only 12 men walked on the moon. So this is a very exclusive um, group of women who were married to, to you know, the moonwalkers. And talking to all of them about their private recollections of that moment was really fascinating. Jane Conrad, who also became a great friend during the writing of the book, her husband Pete, um, who was really sort of swinging astronaut, he uh, was the third man to land on the moon. And I was asking Jane um, just about that moment. And she'd had this uh, moonwalking party at her home. Her house was full of people. They're up in the middle of the night. And she, she decided she really wanted a private moment with the moon. So she goes outside to her backyard and just looks up at the moon. And she's had a whirlwind few days. Emilio Pucci designed a dress for her to watch to Pete's launch. I mean, you know, she's just been being feted as, you know, Mrs. Queen Moon. But she goes up outside, looks at the moon, and she said she remembered suddenly being a little girl looking for the man in the moon. And then she said, oh my god, my husband is the man in the moon, you know? And she said, god, is this what it feels like to like be on LSD, what I've read about in Life magazine? Because of course, drugs did not touch the Jetsons, you know, togethersville. But, uh, you know, then she said she just sort of snapped out of it and had to go back inside and clean up after that launch party. This is Reen and Scott Carpenter doing the twist at a dance for astronauts. And they were seen as the beatnik couple. And really, um, that ended Scott's career at NASA um, pretty promptly after his mission, because NASA did want that perfect Boy Scout image that John Glenn fulfilled and that perfect Girl Scout astronaut to go along with it. And the Carpenters were just way too cool. Scott would play the guitar down in Cocoa Beach and sort of look at the moon and make up like groovy songs. And Reen would later campaign for Bobby Kennedy and was, you know, always encouraging the astronaut wives to break out of their mold. So uh, these were things that were definitely frowned upon um, in the community. I always think, what kind of comments would you get if you posted that on Facebook today? <laughs> but uh, many of the wives really, you know, look like or expressed to me that they felt like the rocket about to take off themselves. And she's watching her husband just about to launch into space. And uh, just a picture with her kids during that moment. Um, the, the book covers uh, the years from 1959 to 1972 and goes through the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions. And a lot of people have asked me, well, how did I make sense of it all? And how did I decide which stories to tell? And I sort of, you know, really let the stories guide me in an organic way, but obviously focused on the, the narratives that had the most drama for the women. And I didn't expect Apollo 8 to be such um, a force in the book, but I became, it really became my favorite mission. It's the first mission to orbit the moon. It happens over Christmas 1968, and it's just an incredibly romantic mission. This is the first time three humans are going to um, journey around the moon. Their wives are back at home. The stakes are very high. The wives are told by the flight director they only have a 50-50 chance of making it home. Um, yeah. <laughs> the men read Genesis as they're going around the moon before they're about to perform this critical maneuver. Um, and you have wives on both sides of the spectrum. The uh, commander's wife, Susan Borman, she really was having a hard time um, dealing with this stress. And 
all the women went to a doctor at NASA, so all their medical, um, you know, is taken care of at basically, you know, mission control. And, you know, they weren't allowed to have the nervous breakdown. If they, if they showed any cracks in the facade, they were afraid it would affect their husband's career. So oftentimes it was like a mother's little helper and then go home and just, you know, vacuum it under the rug or something. Um, but Susan sort of struggled with alcoholism, which she was later outspoken about. And she actually starts writing her husband's eulogy while he's going around the moon. She thinks he's not going to make it home. But this is that moment where the ship comes around after a critical maneuver and you get the transmission back to their squawk boxes. Roger, please be informed there is a Santa Claus. And so these women are just like, yes, they're making it home. Our boys are coming home. Um, very cute story in this mission was Jim Lovell, who of course is later the commander of Apollo 13, was going to be away from his wife during Christmas and decided he wanted to do something really special for her. So Marilyn wakes up on Christmas, Jim's still, you know, at the moon, and there's a, there's a Rolls Royce outside of her home. A driver comes out from Neiman Marcus, has a box. She, um, on top, it's a sequin model of the Earth and the Moon in a tiny little spaceship, which she has to this day. She opens up the box. There's little st stars in the tissue, and it's what every woman wanted back then, a mink. And the best part about the gift is the card that comes with it. It says, to Marilyn, love the man in the moon. <laughs> so some spacey romanticism there. This is just another picture of Apollo 11, which will celebrate the 45th anniversary of this summer and just the complete exhilaration of the women for all the hardships they went through. I've never heard one of them say they would have traded this experience for anything. Um, and it's interesting to note because out of about 30 space marriages, only a handful of the couples survived. Um, about five, and Annie and John Glenn, and Marilyn and Jim, um, Joan and Buzz, their marriage didn't survive. It was sort of the emotional cost of the program, and just those long separations from the husbands, and also the husbands changing through this experience of, you know, journeying to the moon. And this is Apollo 11, and this is Neil Armstrong's wife, Janet, with her sons, watching it take off. And I'd just like to thank you all so much for um, your attention and uh, being part of this story, which I think really recognizes, I think we're at a point in history where, you know, we're doing the whole like lean in thing, you know, we're beyond the feminist m mystique. And, you know, there was really the opportunity with this story to focus on what, it go what goes into making an American hero. I mean, we all have this very macho vision of NASA and even, you know, the meatball logo, as they call it, and, you know, the astronauts going to the moon. And these really were the quiet heroes in the background. And um, one of the most gratifying things after the book came out was not only the wives' reaction, who they really loved it, but it was also the astronauts, because the, I think the astronauts had been more nervous than the women. It was like, what skeletons are going to come out of the closet? And there were plenty of those, but we had this wonderful um, launch party in Houston, pun intended, of course, and there were about 200 people there and all sorts of socialites that they used to um, socialize with back in the day, and we had a jazz band playing you know, moon out over Manhattan and fly me to the moon. And all the women were wearing this yellow rose corsage, which is their yellow rose of Texas. And many of them to this day wear a golden charm bracelet with a little golden whistle that means whistle and I'll be there. But Gene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon in 1972, he grabbed the microphone and he just sort of gave an impromptu speech looking around the room and he said, if it wasn't for the women and what they did back at home, we would have never made it to the moon. And it was just sort of tears all around. So this is Mrs. Wright's stuff. So thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has anything.
I will just say this. I have seen a lot of all their rest, um, presentations, and you are a natural. You are so amazing, <laughs> and so you glow, and it, it's just so fascinating, but I love this book. I recommend it to everyone. Thank you. Oh, and one other thing I should mention is ABC is making a mini-series based on the book that comes out in the fall, so um, it's really going to rock it off then. And they're going to film it all in Houston and in these you know, mid-century modern homes and are just going to get into all the fashion details, sort of a Mad Men goes to the moon. Um, they're casting it right now, and I put all of the news up on, you know, my Facebook and website, but they picked some really great people from all, all sorts of shows we all know and love. Did any of them comment about Cutback and NASA and the space program and anything? Yeah, I mean, these women are almost, I mean, back in the day, you know, we didn't send a woman into space until the 80s, you know, so the... the the task they took on, they were almost like they felt like the closest women could get to being an astronaut. And that's how much they believe in the program and in exploring space. And so I think they're all sad that, you know, we've cut back in that just, you know, because it's part of our national identity. So I think they'd all like to see us, um, see younger generations really get engaged in what it means to have, to dream big. You know, Kennedy saying we're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade. And the fact that we accomplished that, many of the wives reflected just when I was talking to them that, you know, not only was it a dream world because, you know, my adrenaline was running so high during that entire decade, but just what we accomplished, it, you know, it almost seems like a dream today. And I think it does for everyone, whether you lived through it or not. was here in Florida. We really loved it. And yeah. Cape Canaveral, which became Cape Kennedy. Right. And then Johnson became president and moved the whole thing over to Houston. Was there much of a, any mention about that and the politics involved? Um, well, LBJ was from Texas, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Houston just welcomed the astronauts with open arms. I mean, they wanted, it was going to really launch Houston as a city. It's renamed Space City USA. The Mercury 7 astronauts are given a huge parade when they come there. They're given Stetsons. They're building their dream homes. They're even offered free homes, which they can't accept. But, you know, the program still stays in Florida because it's where they do all their training. It's where the rockets take off from. And the husbands are spending most of their time in Florida and at the various... Yeah. Yeah. I don't get into it so much the politics, more like the beehives and the devil eggs. <laughs> <laughs> the important details. Yeah. No, it's funny though, writing about the women, you know, I got a little nervous before I started the book. I thought, God, well, I'm not, I'm definitely not a science writer. Can I handle this? And I remember being in Marilyn Lovell's living room, and these really feel like historical figures, living rooms, and you have Jim's space memorabilia hanging around, and the pastel impressionist paintings she collects, and it's a really incredible sort of mix. And so I said to Marilyn, right before Jim came home, because we had about like a five hour, just like girls sit down in front of the fireplace, I said, wait, how many times did Jim go around the moon again on Apollo 8? And she looks at me and she's like, I don't know. You're going to have to ask Jim. So I was like, I am r I'm hanging out with the right group of women. So, you know, I felt like anyone can Wikipedia any other detail they want. But, you know, the women have waited long enough to tell their side. So I was going to focus on the emotions. I read a really funny uh, episode on that. Um, the astronauts were Douglas Brinkley's biography on uh, Walt Cronkite, who was Mr. Space Program. Yeah. And he and Wally Shira were going to be co-anchoring for the walk on the moon. And for weeks ahead of time, uh, Wally was teasing Walter about, you're going to have a great line ready and written for this moment when he steps on the moon. I just know it. And what is it, Walter? Share it with me. Let me know. And he demurred totally. Yeah. And the great moment comes, and uh, uh, what does Walter say? Wow. <laughs> Doesn't he say hot dog? <laughs> One of the newscasters says hot dog, which is so great. <laughs>
yeah, Wally was Jolly Wally. He was the jokester astronaut. He, you know, of course, gave his wife quite a tough time at home, always making jokes. But they were they were actually very competitive with each other, which is I think where his humor derived from. Because Joe told me, like, even when she would play tennis against her husband, like he wouldn't just play nice. He would like <laughs> slam the ball. You know, I mean, they were these guys were so macho, and they are to this day. Yes. Great question. Um, I interviewed many of the Astro kids, as they're known, and um, in many ways it was like growing up in the cradle of, of the American dream. And they all, you know, talk about the neighborhoods they grew up so fondly. Actually, in the space suburbs, which are composed of these little subdivisions, there was a pool shaped like a mercury capsule. I mean, everything was very spacey. There was a synchronized swimming team known as the Aquanauts. You know, uh, the kids would remember fondly. Oh, it was so great! My mother would, you know, just be really stressed out. She would lock us out of the house and say, "Don't come home before dinner." You know, we would just ride our bikes and have the best time. Um, but you know, then I would say, "Well, what was it like having an astronaut as a father?" Oh, it was no big deal. You know, my best friend across the street, his dad was an astronaut. We had a rocket scientist to this side. We had the NASA doctor over there. So that's what kind of insular environment it was. But I think it was also very difficult having sort of a hero dad who was a celebrity, but also an absentee father because of the demands on their time. But the kids are also part of that reality show that, you know, Life Magazine makes their lives into because be like, it was weird, you know, I just remember like all of a sudden getting pigtails in my hair. We had to go out to the jungle gym in the backyard and eat ice cream with dad. And there's a <laughs> photographer there, you know, <laughs> we never got to do this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think there could be a whole book written about their experience as well. Well, one of, one of the kids um, is a very successful video game. Um, developer and he actually um, you know paid the Russians to go into space so you know some of them went into space related fields or became pilots um, sort of varies across the board one of them was an actress on all my children oh. yeah oh. Um, Pat Collins is not daughter. that I watched all yeah that. one of the <laughs> little girls who is, the little girl who was given that teddy bear with a microphone in his stomach oh. yeah Well, I invite you to read the book. Thank you. Thank Have some more cake cookies over there. <laughs>